Good evening. Uh, I'm Jerry Curtis uh, from the Weather Head East Asian Institute, and it's my honor and a really great personal pleasure to be able to welcome Foreign Minister Taro Kono at the Columbia University. <clears throat> Foreign Minister Kono has served in the Japanese diet since uh, 1996 in the lower house, and he's, he's held m many important positions. He was chairman of the Foreign Affairs Committee in the House, Senior Vice Minister of Justice, Chairman of the National Safety Commission and Minister on Administrative Reform, among other things. But nothing, nothing he has done in his career has been more important than what he's going to be doing now. Being Foreign Minister of Japan at a time of turmoil in the international political system, the existential threat posed by North Korea and challenges to the survivability of the international economic liberal order. He brings unusual qualifications to help him manage the responsibilities that he now shoulders. Over the years of his service in the Japanese parliament, in the Diet, he's shown himself to be independent-minded, knowledgeable and thoughtful about international affairs, an idealist and a pragmatic realist at one and the same time. He's a graduate of Georgetown University. Um, uh, did his undergraduate work at, at Georgetown. He knows America well. And as you will soon discover if you don't know it already, he speaks English as well as any of us. <laughs> so, without further ado, I'd like you to join me in welcoming Foreign Minister Kono. Well, good evening. Wow. <laughs> I'm kind of overwhelmed. Are you sure you're in the right room? <laughs> well, Dr. Curtis, uh, distinguished guest, ladies and gentlemen, I'm truly honored to be here at uh, Columbia University. Um, Columbia University once accepted me uh, for undergraduate study. That was, what, 30 some years ago. And I thought I would never study in New York City. So I passed up and went to Georgetown in Washington, DC. I'm wondering uh, where I might be if I had come to Columbia then. <laughs> when I was 18 years old, I told my father, I got to go to the States to study. And my father asked me, for what? <laughs> so I said, well, Dad, when I become Prime Minister of Japan, <laughs> and when I have a bilateral meeting with American President, most likely he doesn't speak Japanese. <laughs> so I have to be able to speak English. And he said, are you crazy or something? <laughs> so when I was just about to start telephone conversation with the Secretary of State, Mr. Tillerson, I was thinking, hey, Dad, I wasn't really crazy. <laughs> and then we start telephone conversation with an interpreter on each side. Because Georgetown is in Washington, D.C., we had a, a couple of kings, some president, and many foreign ministers come to talk to the students there. And I thought then, just exactly what you're thinking right now. 
the world need younger foreign minister. <laughs> well, I did my best. <laughs> when I was going to Georgetown, uh, there was a Dr. Madeleine Albright, who later became ambassador to the United Nations and then the Secretary of State. I took her seminar on the American foreign policy process. And uh, I wrote a paper in a seminar about the famous uh, senator, sen uh, chairman of Foreign Relations Committee, uh, Senator William Fulbright. And he lost to a rookie candidate, Mr. Dale Bumpers, in uh, Democratic primary for the Senate in Arkansas. And I studied about the election and I wrote a paper. And my conclusion was, you can say whatever you want to say about the foreign policy, but what really matters is the price of pork in the market nearby. <laughs> so I really should be talking about the price of pork, but uh, instead of that, let me talk about the perspective from East Asia today. The international order is shaking. The stability and the prosperity of the international community have been upheld by the overwhelming power of the United States and the value of the dollar and US political strength. But now, the existing international order is facing various challenges. One mistake could lead to a severe crisis in the international community. The foremost challenge we are facing is North Korea's nuclear and missile threat. North Korea has launched nearly 40 ballistic missiles since last year, including two ballistic missiles that flew over Japan. The Japanese citizens are full of anxiety. On September 3rd, North Korea also conducted its sixth nuclear test. Some analysts say that its destructive capability was 10 times larger than that of atomic bomb dropped on Hiroshima. Furthermore, North Korea is estimated to be advancing its technology of intercontinental ballistic missile to the point that they can reach here, New York City. So we are now facing a threat that is more grave and imminent to the security of the international community, including the United States. The second challenge is how to cope with an emerging China. Chinese economic growth has provided opportunities to the world. At the same time, as symbolized by the construction of an aircraft carrier, China is boosting its military capacity in a rapid and non-transparent manner based on its economic power and is flexing its muscle around the world. Under such circumstance, the big issue now is how to secure the global strategic balance. The third challenge is international terrorism. Terrorism is absolutely unacceptable because it not only takes the lives of innocent people, but also hinders creative thinking and free economic activities. Since September 11, the fight against the terrorism is still ongoing, and these threats have been expanding 
throughout the Middle East and Africa, as well as Europe, United States, and Asia. The fourth challenge is the rise of protectionism. We believe that globalism has enlarged the economic pie and has brought greater prosperity to human beings. But now, many countries are suffering from inequality, job losses, and rise in the number of the immigrants. As a result, protectionism and inward-looking trends are growing as a backlash to the globalism. The fifth challenge comes from cyberspace. The cyber attacks are becoming more sophisticated and more complicated, developing at the breakneck speed. Cyber attacks are not only eroding our economic activities, but they are beginning to undermine the foundation of democratic institutions. Threats are creeping up behind the international community. We need to prevent future crisis by upholding the existing international order with our wisdom, courage, and action. I believe there are three principles the international community needs to uphold. The first principle is respect for international laws and rules. Without the rule of law, coercion by power becomes widespread. Human beings have overcome violence with law and freed ourselves from Hobbes' world of the war of all against all and shaped the modern world with rationality. Attempts to change the status quo by force or coercion should never be tolerated. International dispute should always be resolved based on international law. The rule of law is very wisdom created by human beings. The second principle is respect for diversity. The world consists of a variety of ethnicities, religions, and political regimes. The spirits of diversity and tolerance to others are essential for the development of an inclusive society. The third principle is respect for freedom and openness. Open societies that respect freedom of thought and action allow people to dream and hope. Authoritarian societies deprive freedom from people, making them spiritless and sluggish. Therefore, we need to continue to support free and open international order. Rising from ash of the war more than 70 years ago, Japan started to pave the way for reconstruction with generous support from international community, including the United States. After creating a free and democratic new Japan, we in turn have been assisting developing countries with international cooperation. And I am very proud of that history. But with the ch changing international environment, however, Japan should play an even bigger role together with like-minded countries in order to uphold these three principles. First, Japan is assuming bigger responsibility in the area of security and defense more than ever before. Japan has increased its defense budget for five consecutive years, upgrading our defense capability, such as Japan's own ballistic missile defense. Furthermore, we are prepared to do more for the stability of the world. Recent security legislations have enabled us to expand our security cooperation with the United States and other partners. Second is North Korean issue. A nation's will and the capability are necessary to resolve the international challenges. And I believe Japan is equipped 
with both. But of course, Japan cannot do it alone. A strong Japan-US alliance is essential in confronting the threat of North Korea. So is a trilateral security cooperation among Japan, the United States, and South Korea. China and Russia are also influential actors that play key role in this issue. They share the view with Japan that North Korea must give up its nuclear ambitions. With a robust Japan-US alliance, Japan will actively engage with countries like China and Russia, even though we are not always on the same page. The United Nations Security Council Resolution 2375 unanimously and very promptly adopted on September 12th. And that includes the regulation of supplying crude oil and petroleum products to North Korea. Sanctions by the relevant Security Council resolution will cut off more than 90% of North Korea's export revenue of approximately 2.7 billion annually. I applaud the effort of the US negotiators led by Ambassador Haley. Despite international calls for the peaceful solutions, North Korea has never stopped escalating provocation. In addition, it is a fact that North Korea was secretly proceeding with nuclear programs while engaging in dialogue with nuclear programs while engaging in dialogue with international community in the past, such as agreed framework in the mid-1990s and the six-party talks at the beginning of the 21st century. It is not the time for dialogue for the sake of dialogue. Now is the time for international community as a whole to maximize the pressure on North Korea to take concrete actions towards the denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. On this note, can you believe there are more than 160 countries that have diplomatic ties with North Korea, the biggest threat to the world today? A number of countries still accept many North Korean workers and maintain their economic ties with North Korea. We have to urge those countries to cut off their diplomatic and economic relationship with North Korea. By fully implementing the relevant Security Council resolutions, we must stop the flow of people, goods, money, and technology into North Korea. We must work together with countries in Southeast Asia, the Middle East, and Africa to close the loopholes in the sanctions. This is what I called for when I visited Manila and Africa this August. This is what I called for when I made a tour in the Middle East in early this month. And this is exactly what I'm calling for at the United Nations this week. I appreciated President Trump's recent remark at the UN General, Se General Assembly regarding kidnapping of a Japanese girl by North Korea. We know some innocent American abductees are also held by North Korea now. I would like to stress to all international community on the need to double our efforts to resolve this issue as soon as possible. Third, when talking about Japan's active role for the peace and prosperity of the regional and beyond, I need to talk about our relationship with China. The global power balance is changing, and rapidly growing China is at the center of the change. It is also a fact that because we are neighbors, difficult issues exist between Japan and China. But 
We are the second and the third largest economies in the world. Hence, we have great responsibility for the peace and prosperity of the region. Therefore, we should not confront each other. We should not allow tension to dominate Asia. We must make Asia a region of peace and friendship. There are many fields in which Japan and China can cooperate, such as finance, trade and investment, environment, disaster prevention, tourism, etc. Increasing mutual understanding through use exchanges and tourism are also extremely important. They are all investment towards the future. Under the idea of mutually beneficial relationship based on common strategic interest, I would like to foster a stable bilateral relationship from a broad perspective. I myself would like to visit China as soon as possible and encourage the mutual visit between the leaders which have been stalled for the past several years. Fourth, Japan is willing to play an even more active role towards the peace and stability of the Middle East. Japan is religiously very tolerant and respectful to Islam, Judaism, and Christianity. We have no colonial history in the Middle East. And Egyptian President El Sisi once said, the Japanese people are walking Korans. <laughs> we may be following the value of Koran without realizing it. The Japanese economy is directly tied to the peace and stability in the Middle East. And we can talk to the United States whenever we need. The United States is another big player in the Middle East. So there is no reason for Japan not to be involved in the Middle Eastern affairs. I visited Cairo last week to hold the first ever Japan-Arab political dialogue. And I articulated my commitment to the Middle East, focusing on, among others, Japan's enhanced political role in the region. Fifth, Japan will also continue to take the initiative for free trade. The recent agreement in principle on Japan-EU Economic Partnership Agreement sent out a powerful message to the world. The US withdrawal from the Trans-Pacific Partnership was very, very regrettable. But we will promptly advance the TPP among 11 countries first, keeping in mind the possibility of the US return to TPP as maybe Trump Pacific Partnership in the future. <laughs> Six, we will also contribute more in tackling issues of failed state. Most of those countries have failed to establish national institution such as parliament, court system, election commission, tax system, law enforcement which must be trusted by its people. If people cannot trust a national institution, they inevitably have to turn to their tribes or sects or religions or whatever, which can only lead to internal unrest. Japan will increase our efforts to support institution building in developing countries. Let me give you some example. In Cambodia, in order to develop its judicial system, young Japanese judges and prosecutors have worked with locals to write laws which will become the basis of Cambodia. In East Timor, Japan provides training for administrators who are engaged in election process 
and training for police officers about the freedom of the media and law enforcement. Japanese self-defense force officers have provided training at the Ethiopian International Peacekeeping Training Center on reforms concerning law and order and election observation, and have contributed to the capacity building of peacekeepers of African countries. We have invited teachers of Islamic boarding school in Indonesia to Japan in order to share Japanese expertise and experience of education. I believe that these support for institution building can be made only by democratic countries with rule of law and respect for basic human rights. And it will lead to peace and stability of the region and thus human security and sustainable economic growth. Japan has been promoting the free and open Indo-Pacific strategy. The Indo-Pacific Ocean links rapidly growing Africa, the Middle East, Asia, and North America. It is indispensable for Japan, US, and like-minded countries such as India and Australia to maintain and develop a free and open maritime order based on the rule of law in this region. Japan strongly supports freedom of navigation operations by the United States and emphasizes importance of strategic port visits of the Navy. Japan and the United Kingdom have agreed to advance the relationship from partners to allies and will continue to conduct joint maritime exercise in Indo-Pacific. This region faces various security challenges, such as maritime safety, piracy, terrorism, smuggling, large-scale disasters. Japan will help de developing countries build better maritime law enforcement capability by granting patrol vessels and providing technical cooperation. Japan also intends to pursue economic prosperity through the reinforcement of connectivity by improving infrastructure, such as seaports, railway, and roads. Let me give you an example of connectivity. Japan is undertaking the construction of East-West Economic Corridor that connects Indochina and Myanmar. The road runs from Da Nang, Vietnam in the east through Laos and Thailand and to Molmain, Myanmar to the west. As you see it, it goes around the Strait of Malacca and the new mile-long second, second Mekong International Bridge that spans Mekong River has increased the traffic volume by eight times. The future plan for this is to connect the road and sea lane to Bangladesh, India, and beyond the ocean to Kenya in Africa. Japan puts emphasis on quality infrastructure. It is not just about the physical quality, but also about the program quality. When investing in and assisting infrastructure project, such as seaports, railroad, roads, pipelines, etc., there are certain international standards that must be maintained. They must be open, transparent, non-discriminatory, environmentally and socially responsible, and financially sound. When giving sovereign loans to the developing countries, you must pay attention to the debt situation of the recipient country. We must be responsible for the quality of the infrastructure project in which we invest, assist, and give aid to, to really help steady growth of developing countries. Japan is not and will not be a dominant military power. 
And for the foreseeable future, Japan's population is shrinking and aging, unfortunately. We have no oil, gas, uranium, and not much else. However, Japan should not, cannot, and will not be a follower in the world. We will capture the sign of change, respond rapidly to the intense fluctuations of the global tide, and together with the United States and allies and partners, lead the world to be more peaceful and prosperous. Japan must become a beacon for the world. That is my belief. In just one month after taking this position as a foreign minister, which was August 3rd, I attended ASEAN-related foreign ministers meeting in Manila. The Japan-US Foreign and Defense Ministerial meetings, or so-called 2 plus 2, in Washington. The ministerial meeting of the Tokyo International Conference on African Development in Maputo, Mozambique. The Eastern Economic Forum in Vladivostok. Japan Arab Political Dialogue in Cairo. And visited Middle East to meet two kings, a crown prince, a president, and nine foreign ministers. Every day, I feel the importance and the heavy responsibility of my duty as foreign minister. We tend to be pessimistic. Easygoing optimism is dangerous. But I would still like to conclude my remarks by quoting Thomas Friedman. Pessimists are usually right, and the optimists are usually wrong. But all the great changes have been accomplished by optimists. No matter how challenging the situation, let us keep hope and let us get over difficulties with wisdom, courage, and action. Thank you very much. And I do hope at least one of you here will one day become foreign minister or secretary of state and give a speech at Georgetown. Thank you. <laughs>
I think your observation is correct that not many young Japanese uh, interested in uh, security discussion. Um, partly because there's a, we have very strong ally, the United States, and that we have been depending on uh, American forces to protect Japan. And the security discussion always comes back to Article 9 of the Constitution. So it's more like legalistic discussion rather than realistic uh, response to the situation. Right now, uh, two missiles flew over Japan and our neighboring country uh, has developed nuclear weapon, uh, which is very uh, big and strong. So I think it is time for the Japanese to seriously sit down and debate what our defense policy should be. And there are still uh, people who talk about dialogue. Yes, we need to come to table to talk to the North Koreans, but when we look back, during the discussion between US and North Korea on agreed framework, or during the six party talks, what they had done is they came to a table, they pledged something, but when they turned around, they did something totally different. They have developed a nuclear weapon, they have developed a missile. So the dialogue, for the sake of dialogue, would just give them some time to develop more weapons. So we really need to put the pressure on North Korea so that they would show their clear intention and come to the table. That's the message I'm trying to convey to uh, my people. Um, it is not easy. Uh, I, th I think people tend to hear what they like to hear. Uh, dialogue sounds easier than putting pressure. But our, I think it's time for the Japanese, especially the younger generation, to open up and see the reality and start thinking about uh, or talking about uh, security issues. So you'll be welcome back in Japan to lead the debate. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Hana Juge? Good evening. I'm a student at Columbia College, and my question is whether Trump's uncertainty, uncertainty surrounding President Trump's policy allows for Prime Minister Abe to push his agenda to enhance Japan's defense capabilities. Well, I think President Trump has been very firm that United States is with Japan and South Korea 100%. Uh, that his assurance, including the extended deterrence, is uh, very helpful for Japan and South Korea right now. Um, if, say, if China sees current situation is leading uh, in increasing in defense posture of Japan and South Korea, or alliance among US, Japan, South Korea is getting stronger, then China would think North Korea is no longer their asset. It is their liability. And they would probably take North Korea's hand and bring them come to the table. So I don't, I don't, well, President Trump tweet a lot of things. I haven't followed everything yet, but 
on the security issues, especially in the context of North Korean crisis, he has been very firm. And uh, that might send a clear signal, or the, maybe sending a clear signal to China that if they leave the situation as it is, maybe Japan's security posture would change. And we just hope uh, China would put some more pressure on North Korea to come to the dialogue table. Thank you. Uh, many students obviously have questions regarding North Korea. Um, Nicholas uh, Reinhold, Yang Wenzhou, and Shirley Zhang, and Dylan Rothman all have questions about North Korea. But um, we don't have time for everybody, so I'm going to ask Dylan to ask his question. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Dylan Rothman. I'm also a student at Columbia College, and my question is as follows. Uh, in your speech, you mentioned that uh, conversation for conversation's sake would not work with North Korea. So my question is, uh, what specific diplomatic and or economic actions uh, can Japan take uh, with regard to other countries in East Asia that could encourage them to uh, stop their trading with North Korea. Thank you very much. Well, if every country implement uh, relevant Security Council resolutions, 90% uh, of North Korea's export will be cut off. And they will lose that much foreign currency revenue. I, we suspect they are using that for nuclear and missile development. So the one thing is that we really need to implement uh, fully uh, the, those resolutions. And there are many countries that accept North Korean workers and they pay directly to the North Korean government. They don't pay to the workers. And it will probably amount to half a billion dollars annually. And uh, I'm going around the Asia, Africa, Middle East, asking those countries to reduce the number of workers or just simply send them back. And many countries have agreed not to renew the visa or simply uh, asking them to leave. So I think the pressure, the one pressure is economy. If we can cut off the foreign currency revenue, uh, that's one thing. The other thing is North Korea depend on China for oil supply. And China has agreed to reduce 30% of total oil product. And if you just count a petroleum product, I think it will be like a 55%. And that, that counts. In 2003, China cut off the oil supply for a couple of days, uh, saying there was a technical problem. Um, North Korea just flying to six-party talks. So I think that really count at the end of the day. So that's what we are trying to do. Thank you. Um, Latifa? Uh, my name is Latifa. I'm a political science student. Thank you for being with us here today. Uh, my question is, uh, given your recent trip to the Middle East and specifically to Saudi Arabia, um, in what ways do you think can Japan and Saudi Arabia cooperate to face um, security threats in the region and in Asia in general? Thank you. Thank you. Um, as I said, Japan is Japan has no religious problem in the Middle East. Uh, we have no colonial history, right? And uh, I think we are well received by all the Middle Eastern countries. Uh, we have been helping the Palestinian refugees. We have been providing uh, assistance to countries like Jordan and others. 
and Saudi Arabia, Qatar, UAE, uh, we have very strong connection through oil and gas. So we can talk to anybody in the Middle East on the friendly terms. Uh, I went to Qatar, I went to Saudi Arabia, I went to Kuwait. Uh, we all talk about the uh, uh, Qatari issue, the blockade. Uh, we can talk to Qatar, they can talk to us honestly. I can talk to Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia and he tells, he tells me what he really thinks. And we are good friends of Iran. Uh, we can talk to Iranians and we can talk to Saudis. So what we are trying to do is we are trying to help them talk to each other to build up mutual trust among themselves. Um, we don't have a military power, so it's not like United States going in Middle East with 100,000 soldiers. We can't do that. We're not, do, we're not doing it. But we can talk to everybody in the Middle East, and they trust us. And we can use that as a leverage to increase the trust among themselves. If Qatar could talk to Saudi Arabia, or Saudi Arabia can talk to Iran, I think it would develop something. And that's what we are trying to do. So I think not just going in to sell Toyota and buy oil. I think we're going to be politically more involved. Thank you. Um, Jia Ying Hu? Yeah. Um, thank you for being here, Foreign Minister Kono. Uh, so my name is Jia Ying Hu. I'm a PhD student in economics at Columbia. Uh, I'm from China. My family and I are planning a trip to Japan. Uh, so we pay special attention to the impact of current China-Japan relations on travels between these two countries. So what's your view on the future of China-Japan relations and are there any plans to promote people-to-people -people exchanges between um, the two countries, especially those between young peoples in China and Japan? Thank you. Thank you. Um, if you like it or not, we're going to be neighbors for many, many years to come, right? Uh, maybe 100 million years from now, Japan may be a little bit towards the Pacific Ocean, or maybe we are under the sea. But for foreseeable future, we're gonna be next door neighbor, so we have to be friends. And uh, I think it is important to actually uh, go see them, you know, for last three, four years, we have huge numbers of Chinese tourists coming to Japan. My hometown is called Hiratsuka with 250,000 people. Uh, not much to see. Uh, my town is never in any of the guidebook of Japan. But it's very difficult to book hotel because there are a lot of Chinese tourists uh, staying in a hotel in my hometown and they take a bus or train to go see Tokyo next day. So I think it is important to increase the number of tourists in both ways and actually go there and you know talk to them or maybe hand sign. And you still understand they are the same people uh, not much different. And we are encouraged, we are trying to encourage the number of the students going to China or coming to the Japanese university. My parliamentary office usually have one Chinese college students interning in my office. And they are fluent in Japanese. I mean, their handwriting is better than mine. And many of them get a job with Japanese companies. And eventually they go back to China, but they remain good friends of Japan, good friends of us. So I think that's what we really need to do. We need to send more Japanese students going into China. I, I was talking to Foreign Minister Wan Yi, and it's not fair because he understands everything I say <laughs> 
and he usually correct his interpreter. <laughs> but uh, I don't understand anything he says, right? So I have to wait for the interpreter tells me in Japanese. I wish I had learned Chinese. So I think the student exchange or not so young students exchange uh, would be important. And there are a lot of issues. There are a lot of issues. But at the end of the day, it's not that big issue. What, what's important is we are, the, as I said, second and third largest economy right now. And we can do a lot of things. So what I'm saying is not just facing each other, you know, Japan and China, but we need to do shoulder to shoulder. If Japan and China stand shoulder to shoulder and tackle the global issues like climate change or disease or whatever, there are a lot of things we can do and we can make big impact. So that's what I want to do. Thank you. Um, Jeremy? Good evening, sir. Thank you very much for the talk. My name is Jeremy Ho, Master Student in Political Science. My question is um, pertaining to the 2020 Olympics. So the Japanese government is going to host the Olympic Games. And I just want to find out um, how is the government going to use this event besides infrastructure development to bolster both um, its domestic and international standing? Thank you. Thank you. Um, there are a lot of cities and towns who are trying to invite uh, training camps from foreign countries. My hometown. I'm, I'm just talking about my hometown all the time. <laughs> um, we are inviting uh, athletes from Lithuania, and they probably have like a good basketball team, like Georgetown. <laughs> <laughs> well, not, maybe not anymore. <laughs> uh, but the Lithuania has a very good basketball team, and uh, they will come to. Uh, arena in my hometown for practice before the Olympic Games. And there'll be a lot of exchange uh, between uh, athletes and the people in the hometown. And a lot of even small towns are trying to get some kind of training camp. And they will, they will meet people from uh, my next door neighbor is inviting, uh, I think, a runner from Eritrea, um, Djibouti, I think. Um, so you get to you get to meet a lot of people, and that will give a good impression on young Japanese people. And the ja young Japanese people are now increasingly become inward looking. When I was 18, it was like how I can trick my father so that I could go out of Japan. And because I did that, I've been telling my son, hey, you can go abroad for the summer, you know, whole summer, uh, or even a year. And he said, no, he doesn't want. I really have to push him to go out of Japan for a week. And the airplane ticket costs the same, you know, if he goes for a month or a week. <laughs> so it ended up very expensive trip, and it was, it's not just my son. A lot of younger Japanese are not interested in going abroad, and that has to change. So 2020 Olympic game could be eye openers for younger generation, and that's what I'm hoping for. And because it's Olympic game, we are expecting more foreign tourists coming to visit us. And they, I hope they are not just coming to Tokyo because it's going to be so bad in terms of traffic, <laughs> right? The hotel is going to be very expensive. So hope after or before the Olympic game, they will go around Japan and meet people. So uh, I think that's what we are looking for. Thank you. Um, you are welcome. <laughs> Please. So um, unfortunately, we're out of time. So uh, one last question from Riku.
Thank you very much for your talk. I'm Riku Tabata. I'm a second year student at Columbia College. So my question is, if you were the Prime Minister of Japan, or if you were to like replace Abe-san like tonight, what would you do differently from what Prime Minister Abe is doing right now? <laughs> you know he's in town. <laughs> <laughs> That's a very dangerous question. Um, I think there are two things that I would like to do. Uh, the first thing is uh, we really need to look at the pension system. The whole society is aging. And uh, we have something called the macroeconomic slide, which is to reduce the pension into the future. So for people like Hikotani-san, who is very young, uh, wouldn't know how much pension she's going to be getting when she retires. So what happened is you don't know if you can rely on the pension. You start to save, meaning consumption goes down, and that's bad for economy. So I think what we really need to do is uh, changing the pension system. I think that's something we really need to do. And another issue is energy. Uh, I mean, the United States have experiencing is experiencing uh, a lot of hurricane, strong hurricanes. Uh, we did with a strong typhoon, and because of the climate change, I think the seawater temperature is rising, and the hurricane, typhoon, monsoon will be getting much much stronger. I was minister for disaster management before becoming foreign minister, and uh, it, it is. It's going to be really bad. So I think we really need to do something about the climate change. And in order to do that, I think we need to stop using the fossil fuel as soon as possible, uh, meaning we really need to invest in the renewable. Uh, I think Japan could achieve 100% renewable um, if we set our mind to. So if I were prime minister, I would say by year 20 whatever, we go 100% renewable and we drive the economy uh, uh, towards that. But don't say that I said that today. <laughs> so we all have um, some secrets to keep tonight, but um, finally I'd like to ask Professor Patrick for closing remarks. Wow. <laughs> That's my reaction to this evening. Uh, uh, I, I just want to say that in defense of your son, he's only in the ninth grade. Right? Ninth grade. So, right. <laughs> th th there's still hope for him. Uh, but, but the general point, I think, that uh, uh, Japanese are so comfortable in the Japan that they're less interested in going abroad than before is a concern, I think, for all of us uh, who want to see Japan continuing to play the sort of expanding role you've been describing this evening. Um, uh, this has really been a, a wonderful presentation and really great Q&A. And uh, uh, I guess before I say anything more nicely about it, I should say who I am. I'm Hugh Patrick. I'm director of the Center on Japanese Economy and Business and co-director of our APEC Study Center at Columbia with uh, Dean Merritt Jano. Unfortunately for her, she has to be out of the country, so she's missed this tonight. But uh, my job is to s uh, speak on, on behalf of the four Columbia institutional co-sponsors uh, of this event, the Weatherhead East Asian Institute, uh, the School of International and Public Affairs, uh, the Center on Japanese Economy and Business, and the APEC Study Center. Um, I'm sure all of us, um, and certainly, I'm so glad to see many students and so many undergraduate students uh, have found uh, your comments really substantive 
and important, especially given the uncertainties in East Asia and the security sense due to North Korea. Uh, I understand this is the only public speech uh, that Mr. Kono will be delivering in this trip to New York. So we particularly thank you for that. Uh, we will, th you were so substantive that we're going to take time, I think, to absorb what you, you've had to say. So I guess please come again. <laughs> <laughs> um, and um, we will continue this discussion at our reception in a more informal way, which will be outside in the lobby. Uh, and there, uh, uh, Foreign Minister Kono will uh, make a few further brief remarks. Uh, so please remain in your seats and allow the speakers and you and me to exit uh, first. And, uh, and we appreciate your patience. Also, uh, please refrain from taking any photographs during the reception um, and just warning the media that the doorstep interviews are not permitted. So thank you all again for coming and we encourage you to look, come to future events and you can find out about all of them on our, our various websites. But especially thank you so much. It was so, it was so fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.